This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Searching for profit and Google found it. The company topped earnings expectations and its stock soared initially after hours trading. Don't look now, Netflix shares rocket higher, but is the dominant player in video streaming about to face some stiff competition? Five years later, did Wall Street reforms following the financial crisis price people out of the housing market? All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, July 16th. Good evening, everybody. Glad you could join us. A fresh record for the NASDAQ. But we begin tonight with earnings from Google. The company, which is one of the most widely held stocks by mutual funds, reported stronger than expected second quarter results. Earnings of $6.99 a share, trumped estimates by 29 cents. Revenue of $17.7 billion, just about in line with forecast, but was 11 percent higher than last year. And investors like what they saw, sending shares spiking in initial after hours trading, as you see right there. John Ford has the one key thing in the report investors need to watch. One takeaway from the Google earnings call is that YouTube is a big star in this report. New CFO Ruth Porat reporting that viewing time of YouTube videos was up 60% year over year. That's the best growth rate in two years. Mobile viewing time was up 100% and that helped Google uh, despite the currency headwinds that knocked revenue down $1.1 billion. It would have been $1.1 billion higher if not for these currency headwinds. Google would have seen 18% growth in instead of 11%, but that combined uh, with expense discipline sent the stock a lot higher after hours. Guys, back to you. John, thank you. Upbeat earnings and progress in Greece helped send the Nasdaq composite to a new record high in today's session. By the close, the Dow Jones Industrial Average was 70 points higher to finish at 18,120. The Nasdaq was 64 points higher at that new record of 5,163. And the S&P 500 was up almost 17 points. Netflix was far and away the top performing stock today on the S&P 500. Shares surged, get this, 18% to a new high after the company reported a strong quarter and a sharp increase in subscribers, as we told you last night. But even though the company is growing gangbusters, Julia Borston reports that Netflix is about to face a whole lot more competition. Streaming video pioneer Netflix is the industry leader with 65 million subscribers around the world, drawing a range of rivals. In addition to Amazon ramping up its investment in original content for its Prime service, HBO and Showtime have recently launched direct-to-consumer streaming apps. And now CEO Reed Hastings is facing a whole new kind of adversary. Traditional TV providers Comcast and Dish offering slimmed-down digital content bundles. And that's not all. Facebook may have some play in this long term. YouTube should have some play in this. In the past, they should have had a play in this, and they haven't. That was an under-executed opportunity uh, you know, for them. Uh, and then, yeah, of course, Amazon's going to be out there. What Netflix CEO Reed Hastings says will distinguish the service is its content, saying its originals in particular have been a massive draw for subscribers. That's why Netflix is ramping up its investment in all types of originals, series, documentaries, and feature films for a scope of content that analyst Rich Greenfield says will help it stay ahead of rivals, especially since Netflix isn't planning to raise prices, $9 a month for new subscribers. HBO sitting out there charging $15 a month. Showtime's actually being featured 30 days free, but that's an $11.99 product. And you think about you know, where the ceiling is Given the amount of usage, there is no way that the usage of HBO or Showtime is anywhere near Netflix. Hastings says it's not a winner-take-all game. That while Amazon and others are growing quickly, so is Netflix. So what's happening is everyone's maintaining their relative share, uh, but the total amount of Internet viewing is, is growing at a, at a very vigorous rate. So I think they're experiencing significant success on their investments, as is Hulu. I think we'll see that with HBO Now, because there's this massive move from linear programming onto the Internet. One sign of the growing power of streaming video, Thursday Netflix earned 34 Emmy nominations, while rival Amazon went from zero to a dozen nominations. But they're both still dwarfed by HBO's 126 nods. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Borston in Los Angeles. 
And now to results from Dow Component Goldman Sachs. The company reported its smallest quarterly profit in nearly four years. Earnings fell nearly 50 percent as fixed income trading dropped and litigation expenses rose. Shares of the bank closed down $1.78. Well, fellow Blue Chip United Health, also a Dow member, of, fell in trading today. The nation's largest insurer reported higher profit for the second quarter and increased its full year outlook. The company benefited from increased membership in its insurance operations, but analysts are concerned that medical costs grew at a greater rate than expected. That pressured shares today slightly, as you see there. They finished at $124.93. To the economy now, and the number of Americans filing new applications for unemployment benefits fell more than expected last week. Initial claims for jobless benefits dropped 15,000 to a seasonally adjusted 281,000 last week. Levels below 300,000 are viewed as a sign of a healthy labor market. The job market being closely watched, of course, by the Federal Reserve. And today, Chair Janet Yellen told a Senate panel that she expects to see further gains in wage growth. I would expect to see a pickup. It's not a certainty here, but it is, and to my mind, it is evidence of some remaining slack in the labor market. So that's my forecast is that we will see some pickup in wage growth. Yellen also said the three wage measures watched by the Fed are the employment cost index, hourly compensation, and average hourly earnings. Housing is also a key component of the economy, and today a new report showed home builder sentiment is at its highest level in a decade, which was the height of the housing boom. According to the National Association of Home Builders, builders are optimistic about the outlook for sales, which are being supported by job growth and relatively low mortgage rates. New mortgage rules have been put in place since the government passed the Dodd-Frank Act nearly five years ago as a response to the financial crisis. The legislation and the consumer protections that grew from it have imposed a vast array of new regulations on both lenders and borrowers. But are we better off, safer when it comes to mortgage lending? Diana Olick looks at the results. The effect of loose lending during the last housing boom was abundantly clear. Nearly 7 million U.S. homes lost to foreclosure. The response, a credit lockdown caused by new lending rules under Dodd-Frank. For lenders, this is all about paperwork, verification, and doing a lot of the grunt work that was ignored or passed over before the crisis. The rules fill thousands of pages but are pretty simple. Highly risky loan products were banned. Borrowers now have to document their employment and debt levels. Lenders must disclose all the costs involved in each loan. And most importantly, lenders must verify a borrower's ability to repay. If you're a high credit quality consumer, Dodd-Frank just made it a much bigger pain in the butt to get a loan. You got to fill out more paperwork. You got to dig up more tax returns. You got to find information related to retirement accounts, stuff that was never asked for before. But if you're on the low end of the spectrum, it has made it tougher to get that mortgage. Tight credit is blamed for a still falling home ownership rate now at the lowest level in a quarter century. Even the Federal Reserve chair readying to raise interest rates is on that bandwagon. Demand for housing is still being restrained by limited availability of mortgage loans to many potential home buyers. Tight credit is also blamed for a shift in the lending landscape. Large bank lenders are moving out and independent non-bank lenders are moving in. I think Dodd-Frank, not only does it add complexity, but it adds a lot of confusion. It also adds significant costs in both time and labor. Big banks have other businesses that are more lucrative. There are so many ways to make a mistake. And the banks learn from the financial crisis that the regulators will keep coming after you over and over and over again for these errors. So lending is less attractive to big banks. As a result, non-bank lender Loan Depot has tripled in size in the past year. But its CEO claims Dodd-Frank is forcing compliance at the expense of innovation. It's always about making certain that we double check and once we do that we triple check and then making absolutely certain that all the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed because if you don't and you make a mistake, once you make a mistake as a lender, uh, you're not going to be around for long. The home loans being made today are arguably the most pristine in history, but they're also being made at the slowest pace in decades. 
For Nightly Business Report, I'm Diana Olick in Washington. Up next, when are workers employees and when are they contractors? New guidelines defining that difference have the potential to rock businesses small and large. What is inside all those campaign money war chests? The latest filings give us a glimpse at how the fundraising is going as we head into the 2016 elections. The first detailed accounts were released yesterday for the second quarter. And Eamon Javers in Washington has been combing through the filings. Eamon, the results are out. Who's leading, who's lagging, and how? The results are out, Tyler, and it's a fascinating snapshot because what you're seeing is a real surge here in fundraising for Jeb Bush, also Hillary Clinton on the Democratic side, and a surprising candidate, Bernie Sanders, also raising a lot of money here. Take a look now at the top fundraising totals for the campaigns, and you get a sense of who's in the lead here, starting with Hillary Clinton at $47.5 million raised for her campaign. Bernie Sanders, surprisingly large chunk of change here, $15.2 million. Then Ted Cruz with $14 million. Marco Rubio with $12.1 million. On down the list, you see Jeb Bush here at 11.4. Put an asterisk next to that number. It might not matter as much as you think for reasons we'll get into. Then we see Carson, Paul, and Graham rounding out the field here in terms of the fundraising successes here, Tyler. All right, uh, Eamon. You know, the campaign fundraising isn't the whole story, though, Eamon. What's the other key piece of all of this? Yeah, that is the key difference that we're seeing this year. It's not just the campaigns themselves that are raising money, but also the super PACs that are outside the campaign's control that are raising enormous amounts of cash. That's why I said watch that Jeb Bush number. Take a look now at the super PACs themselves and the fundraising that they've done, and you see the picture changes a little bit. Jeb Bush at $103 million for his super PAC. We also see Cruz with $37 million, Rubio 31.8, Clinton with just 24.3. That might be a little bit paltry for Hillary Clinton. Then we see Perry, Kasich, Christie, and Fiorina at the bottom of the list on the Republican side with just $3.4 million raised. So the, once you factor in the super PAC money, the picture changes dramatically, guys. And that's the story of this campaign year. A lot of this money is now going to be outside the direct control of the candidates themselves. All right, Eamon, thank you very much. Eamon Javers in Washington. You bet. Greece received a financial lifeline today when the head of the European Central Bank increased its emergency lending to Greek banks. Julia Chatterley reports from Frankfurt. All we wanted to hear from Mario Draghi today at the European Central Bank meeting was, is he going to give more liquidity to the Greek banks? Well, we got the answer very, very quickly, yes. Thanks to the vote in Greece last night and, of course, the financing arrangements, at least in the short term, which will allow Greece to make that bond repayment to the European Central Bank on Monday the 20th. So very good news in that sense. A lot of rumours swirling about whether or not the banks now will be able to open on Monday. Sources close to the central bank telling us be very cautious at this stage. It's just too early to tell. Similar story as far as capital controls are concerned. We know how long they've been in place in countries like Cyprus. Two years in that sense. So also very difficult to tell. Mario Draghi was asked about what he thought about the talks between countries like Germany and others about whether or not Greece could leave the Eurozone on a temporary basis. He had some harsh words to say on that too. This union is imperfect. Is, and being imperfect is fragile, is vulnerable, and uh, doesn't deliver. That's the very least. It doesn't deliver all the benefits that it could if it were to be completed. And so the future now should see decisive steps on... Uh, further integration. He was forced to admit it's not up to the European Central Bank to decide whether or not Greece leaves or stays in the Eurozone. But he did say, look, at no point throughout the last few months have we ever believed Greece would leave. So perhaps some very strong words, coded message there to Germany that still suggests Greece should or could leave at some point in the future. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Julia Chatterley in Frankfurt.
Citigroup's profit surges, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. Earnings and revenue topped expectations as the bank was helped by sharply lower legal costs and strong trading results. It was Citi's highest quarterly profit in eight years. Shares are up nearly 4% today to $58.59. eBay out with mixed results the day before it spins off its PayPal unit. The company beat on the bottom line, but the top line, the revenues, uh, those results were below forecast. The firm announced an additional $1 billion uh, in its share buyback program. Separately, eBay will sell its enterprise unit for nearly a billion dollars. Shares were more than 3% higher on that news to $65.59. And Sherwin-Williams cutting its earnings outlook for the year, and the paint company offered a weak third quarter forecast. This is stronger dollar and rainy weather hurt demand for its products in certain markets. Uh, shares are off 7.5% today to $261.23. Garmin saw its shares plunge in today's trading session. The firm issued disappointing earnings guidance for the second quarter and cut its yearly profit forecast. The maker of GPS devices blamed currency pressures and increased promotions. The stock slipped 7 percent to 43.10. Mattel swung to a loss and posted its seventh straight quarter of declining sales. The toy maker blamed weak international demand for its Barbie doll. Shares shot up before falling back right after the close. The stock ended the regular session almost 2 percent lower at 25.15. A big beat from Schlumberger on both the top and bottom lines. Despite that, the oil field services provider saw its quarterly profit decline from last year, mainly because of restructuring charges. Shares popped initially in after-hours trading. Before the close, the stock was up a fraction to 83.89. More business travelers are using Uber over traditional taxis. This according to a new report from Certify. That's an expense management system provider. Uber overtook taxis as the most expensed form of ground transportation in the three months ended in June. Certify based its filings on millions of trip receipts uh, at its North, that its North American clients submit. And Uber is just one of many companies that make up the so-called gig economy, which relies on independent workers for short-term projects. The rise of these companies has sparked a debate over when workers are employees and when they're contractors. And the answer could have implications for businesses across the country. And just yesterday, the Labor Department issued new guidance on the topic. Harry Holzer is professor of public policy at Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy, and he joins us to talk about that. Harry, welcome. Nice to have you here. Thank you. Nice to be here. So it seems as though with these new guidelines, the Labor Department is broadening out the definition of employees. Is that a correct read? Uh, they're trying to. They're trying to. Uh, historically, the issue has been who really controls the work, the amount of work, whose equipment. Uh, the Labor Department is now saying if the worker really depends on the company uh, for the job, for the work at all, then they really are an employee. Uh, and they've offered a, a, a broader set of guidelines to determine that. So that's what they wanted to do. In the case of Uber, who controls the work there? Well, <laughs> that will continue to be debated. And I think the courts are going to have to weigh in on that. Uh, you can make the case that the worker owns the car. Uh, the worker chooses when and how much to work. Uh, they take some initiative in terms of how many passengers they pick up and how they drive. All of those things would argue for them to be independent contractors. On the other hand, if the worker is completely dependent on the company for the job at all, it could go the other way. I think the courts are going to have to help us sort mm -hmm. this out. So what are the implications for big businesses versus small businesses? Who do you think this change affects the most? Well. Uh, if someone is classified as an employee, it raises some costs uh, in terms of overtime, minimum wage, uh, Social Security and unemployment uh, taxes. Um, I think it probably affects small businesses a little more because they have fewer margins that they can adjust on. For instance, bigger companies can try to take some of these fees out of, out of, ta out of, out of the wages paid to the worker. Smaller Companies have less flexibility on that. Mm -hmm. So I think it affects smaller companies a little more. On the other hand, we just talked about Uber. Uh, Uber's a, a very large company that this uh, will affect a lot. So uh, it, it depends on, on how, how many of these workers are affected by these decisions. You know, I was going to ask you, you sort of touched on it there. Why does it matter? Um, it matters because uh, once you're called an employee, uh, the company is more responsible 
uh, to provide benefits, say, under Obamacare, mm -hmm. uh, or to pay overtime, or to pay minimum wages. If you're an independent contractor, the company doesn't have to worry about all that. Now, again, some of those higher expenses can come out of, uh, out of the workers' pay. You know, pay, they can be charged a fee. Um, but not all of them. It does cost the company more, and that's why a lot of companies would like to keep these folks mm -hmm. uh, as independent contractors if they can. Yeah, which I would think would lead to a lot of legal challenges. Oh, it will. I think uh, the Labor Department has drawn a pretty fuzzy line. Uh, there's six factors to help determine uh, the answer to the question of, of, of does the worker really depend on the company. You can imagine three factors going one way, three the other. Uh, the courts will really have to weigh in about where that line gets drawn. Harry, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Harry thank Holzer you. at pleasure. Georgetown University's McCourt School of Public Policy. And coming up, the nation's second largest pension fund uses indexing to invest. But is it the right strategy for you? My interview with the chief investment officer of CalSTRS next. to watch for tomorrow. Dow component General Electric will report its quarterly results. The consumer price index, a widely watched indicator of inflation, is due. And also on the data front, housing starts an important read on the health of that industry. And that is what to watch for Friday. Well, Sue, when one of the biggest pension funds in the country makes a move, investors pay attention. And just yesterday, I had a chance to speak with Christopher Ailman, the head of the California State Teachers Retirement System. That's the nation's second largest pension outfit at Delivering Alpha, an investor conference co-sponsored by CNBC and Institutional Investor. Chris, about 70 percent of your U.S. equity portfolio is basically indexed. Why does that work for you? And for the portion that isn't indexed, what do you look for? It works for us and I think it works for individual investors as well because it's low cost. Um, oftentimes active management is expensive and doesn't outperform the market. We have found that three quarters of the time an active manager is not going to beat that broad market. So it's easier for us to own the entire market. And we don't just own the S&P 500. We own a Russell 3000. So we own 3000 stocks in the USA in their proper order, and when the market goes up 1%, we go up 1%. So lock-in average, that's the smart way, yep. the efficient way. And then when you play on the margins, what are you trying to do, and where do you find that extra return that you're looking for? Well, that's part of the challenge. We've often said alpha, repeatable outperformance, which is alpha, is very difficult to find. And we're going to do it through uh, small cap, is an area with the smaller stocks where you start to see growth and value make a bit of a difference. Um, we're definitely going to be investing with people that are that do a deep dive and a deep analysis into the company um, and try to add value. What we have found is it's hard to find those managers. Um, they're not as strong over time. Biggest single holding today is? Apple stock, largest stock in the USA. So whatever is the biggest stock in the USA, it's going to be You're the biggest holding in our portfolio. Of, in, of indexing alone. It exactly. Would the, it would be the biggest one. And I should point out, when, when we index, our cost is literally a fraction of a basis point. On a $50 billion portfolio, it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. A big different fee structure than what you'd pay in a mutual fund. A lot of endowments and public pension funds like yours have started to move into alternative investments. Uh, a lot of the big college ones like Harvard and Yale have big holdings in yeah. hedge funds. Where does that play in your fund uh, and is it expanding? Are you buying more private equity hedge funds? It's about a third of our portfolio and it's going to stay probably a third of our portfolio. Uh, we think we're at 23 billion because we're so huge. We're 23 billion in private equity. We think that that's about the max of the large size you can do. We're about 25 billion in real estate. We could probably grow that, but real estate's fairly valued right now. We are starting to grow our portfolio in things like infrastructure, other long-term, long-dated assets, because 
for long-term patient capital. How important and how limiting are what you describe as the ESG principles that under which you have to, have to operate? Environmental, social, and governance issues. Is it net a positive for you or a restraint for you and your uh, shareholders? Right now we believe it's a, going to be a net positive and it, it's not going to be a value add, it's going to be a risk reduction. Because what we're trying to do is avoid environmental risks, um, uh, social risks that we think our th industries are going to die because they're not adding value. And then we've long argued for over 25 years that good corporate governance actually adds value. So in almost every case, in every asset class, I can make an argument that it's a risk, but it's also going to be an opportunity for gain. And one of the points made earlier today was that in the world of big data, the costs, the externalities, to use a fancy word, of those environmental, social, and governance risks are going to be easier to account for, and it's going to be a bigger risk. No question about it. Uh, it let's take environmental risk. Companies pay to dispose of their water waste, their physical waste. At some point, we believe they're going to be charged a tax to dispose of their gaseous waste. And if you're a long-term owner of a company, then you want to factor that in and it's going to affect earnings. Chris Aylman, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. California State Teachers Retirement System, also known as CalSTRS, has $193 billion in assets under management. The point about big data changing the way yes. costs are accounted for yes. and charged to companies, it's coming in a big way. It sure is. That's an awful lot of yeah. money to manage, too. Fascinating. And they do Learned something job. yesterday. That's Nightly Business Report for tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for watching. I learn something every day. Frankly. I know. You, know? you do. I'm dumb Absolutely. enough. Absolutely. All right, Tyler Matheson here. Have a great evening, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow.